security. And we also did not look at soil carbon or agroforestry because these models did not include, as I said before, carbon sequestration. They only include the non-CO2 gases. And we then uh, calculated um, using two different global data sets. One is a bottom-up te technology by technology uh, estimate. In other words, we added up if you mitigated in rice, if you mitigated in livestock, if you mitigated in um, grasslands, and you added up all of the different impacts of different technologies, what would that be at very low prices, 20 tons of CO2, of CO2 and then um, $20 per ton of CO2. And then we took another model, which is an integrated assessment model, and we looked at what happened if you increase production efficiency, also at low prices. And what did these two different data sets tell us? Uh, you can see here, except that there's no laser. Uh, you can see at the top the three different um, initial estimates of the target and the one gigaton goal that we're trying to reach. And then you can see technical practices only get us 40% of the way there. And production efficiency only gets us 21% of the way there. In other words, we have a huge gap <coughs> between the mitigation we need to achieve in the agriculture sector and the mitigation we could achieve. And these are already extremely aspirational estimates because they assume global scale changes and global levels of technology change. So, so we have a real problem. So, and I should say that we can consider these to be the plausible interventions in contrast to the aspirational target. So again, only 21 to 40 percent of the plausible mitigation interventions would achieve the one degree tar uh, would The plausible interventions only achieve 21 to 40 percent of the target. So that means we need to think beyond current practices. The, um, Glo the Global Research Alliance for Agricultural Greenhouse Gases has created this racetrack of um, technology options in the livestock sector. You can see at the bottom the practices that we already have, and you can see at the top the more blue sky <coughs> options for the future, and then they've divided them into everything from animal health and breeding to grassland management, manure management. So what we need to do if we're trying to achieve this two degree target is obviously get more of the um, practices in the pipeline, like vaccines for livestock or uh, genetic traits for reducing emissions, get those into our um, current best practices. Now I haven't explicitly talked about other options that are related in the agriculture sector, whether that's soil carbon or the impact of agriculture on deforestation, um, shifting dietary patterns, so changing consumption patterns, decreasing food waste or um, other aspects in specific livestock um, or in specific um, supply chains like livestock. And here we've just summarized um, numbers, especially from the IPCC, of the minimum and the maximum that, are pos that have been shown to be possible in each of these um, sectors. These do not represent a target, right? So while you might say, oh, we only need to meet one gigaton, right, of CO2 equivalents in order to achieve our target, and, you know, you can get four from the forestry sector, if you, if you included all of these options, the target would be somewhere between probably four and six gigatons, right? So the target depends on what you decide to include. And I would suggest that we really need to start developing targets in each of these areas. So just to conclude, uh, I think we all need to ha keep in mind what is our aspirational target in order to achieve the two degree um, goal. And in agriculture for the non-CO2 gases, that's one gigaton. Not mitigating in agriculture is either going to increase the cost of mitigation or it's, going to meet we don't, or it's going to mean that we don't meet our two degree target. Okay, so we have to be really serious about trying to achieve something in agriculture, otherwise it's going to cost us more or we're not going to reach our target. And in the end, we have to think about some radical technological and policy changes in order to achieve the two degree target, whether that's breeding, and we have to really think out of the box, low methane rice, low methane livestock, uh, putting uh, biological nitrification inhibitors into our cereal, cereal crops or thinking about really different policies than what we have now. And I'm very excited to say that we have a number of options that our panelists are now going to present to you um, to help us think about some of these options. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you're just joining, again, my name is Daniel, and I'm um, here as a youth with Sustain Us, um, and just want to call up our next. Uh, so we're now going to have four different folks present 
about kind of different elements of um, what, what was just spoken about. So first up is going to be uh, Rosa Roman, who is an all-star scientist and associate researcher at, um, how do you pronounce the name of the university? Where you Wageningen. Wageningen University. Thank you. So again, I'm going to sit, uh, I'm going to give this to you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit in this chair and hold up a card when there's two. Good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I, I'm back on stage, please. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Sorry about this technical um, confusion. We're right back. So I'm going to try to convince you why it is important to invest on um, climate mitigation through restoration and conservation of peatlands. Mm -hmm. Um, there are several reasons why, if I were an investor, I th would consider important into preserving and conserving and restoring um, peatlands. One would be that we are talking about carbon-dense ecosystems, so we would receive higher mitigation returns per uh, unit area. There is very few other ecosystems that clearly have um, higher synergies with adaptation and also that um, would respect and would promote um, ecosystem services is providing as, as wetlands and peatlands do. And therefore, by promoting mitigation in these ecosystems, we're also benefiting um, and promoting co-benefits. Co um, I would also be interested, if I were an investor, in looking at areas that um, also participate in highly in global um, emission budgets. And we're talking about peatlands and wetlands um, participating up to 10% of the global <coughs> alpha greenhouse gas emissions in um, the decade of 2000-2009. Then um, the trends. What are the future trends? I want to protect something that I know is going to be uh, at risk so the additionality can be higher. And peatlands um, are heavily under risk through increased drought, increased fire and increased agricultural expansion through global commodity demand. Um, and also, interesting point from investors is that even though restoration is certainly an option, we do need to regret um, degraded uh, peatlands. Conservation and no action on, the, on this um, uh, high carbon densi density ecosystems would be our choice. So we're talking about something that would be cheaper than restoring. Also, on the opportunity windows, we're talking about political momentum. Uh, the things are heavily uh, promoted under the Paris Agreement, the conservation, the restoration, the enhancement, and also social momentum. There is, uh, on the news for the last several years, we have seen the health impacts of peatlands burning on in Indonesia. So there is um, a momentum in terms of peatlands having reached the public opinion. People are severely concerned about it. Um, also, we count right now on interesting uh, transformative transparency initiatives such as TRACE, which has been presented today here, which is uh, Transparency for Sustainable Economies, which is basically disentangling the spider web of um, commodity um, contributor, uh, supply chain commo uh, commodity um, contributors. So from the producers to the distributors to the consumers. And this is not only helping us understand uh, who is participating and who is who, so that we can disentangle the um, mitigation needs from the these different stakeholders, but also puts consumer into the, the, the right platform of climate change mitigation. It's not only um, supply side mitigation, but demand side mitigation. And most importantly, we're counting of new data. And new data is extremely important for wetland and peatland restoration and, and conservation because one of the main reasons countries are not including uh, peatland into their national targets is because they are lacking data. We don't have enough data so far to establish peatland baselines and to establish MRV systems that will contribute to trace on the future um, the trends of the emissions, but also um, to produce robust greenhouse gas inventories. So there is a technical issue around it. Where are the peatlands? How dense they are? What is the carbon stocks? What are the carbon contents, the bulk densities? And we will see how new data is appearing and why it is an opportunity to invest right now. Of course, the technical barriers are also related to political, social, and financial frameworks. This is the new data um, that we have produced. This is Gumbrich et al. This is right now under review. And it's showing us a very different panorama of the peatland. It's particularly in the tropics and subtropics, which are the regions that have less data and that are the ones that will be suffering from higher impacts of climate change. Right now, our understanding is that Southeast Asia is the country with the highest amount of peats, with the highest contribution 
of peat to the global and uh, sorry to the tropical domain. What we see now is that th this is biased, and this is biased by research, and this is biased by accessibility. We are discovering or, or putting into publications. Discovering <coughs> is, is a big word. Uh, large extents peat deposits, I both in Africa, like the Kuvet Central Congolese, in the border between Congo and Congo DRC, up to seven meters of peat, very extends, more than 100,000 square kilometers. The same for the Pastaza Marañón region in the northern jungles of the Loreto um, Peruvian jungles, uh, up to uh, nine meters of peat uh, deposits, um, very um, unmapped yet. And also, what is exciting from our map is that we are finding a lot of underreported uh, peatland hotspots that um, are mainly concentrating and shifting the importance of, of peat out of Southeast Asia and into Latin America. In our data, the main contributor of peat in volumes and stocks is not Southeast Asia, is Latin America, the Brazilian Amazon, and particularly uh, Brazil. So with the examples of uh, underreported peatlands in the Amazon Basin, in the Rio La Plata, Paraguay, Paraná, um, Argentina contributes strongly. Then we also see other peatlands in, in Asia, not yet reported, like Bangladesh, um, the Delta, the river deltas in, in Cambodia, uh, sorry, Cambodia, in the, um, Vietnam, etc. And some other areas in Africa. So and just to finish, what is this important? It is important because some of these underreported pit areas are just now suffering from intensified drought effects. They are on the borders of frontier. And then we have a lot to learn from what is happening in Southeast Asia. So we don't want to repeat the same um, mistakes that we have now done in Southeast Asia of uh, pit um, uh, conversion and, and peat degradation, and basically the numbers are huge, so the potential for mitigation is also huge. Um, basically we're talking about threefold increases in area of peatlands in the tropics, there is peatland, much more peatland than before, that, um, before um, reported, much higher volumes and much higher stocks. So we're talking about a global phenomenon, um, and I hope this is a topic that would interest investors. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rosa. Oh, whose slides are next here? So, um, can we, you can pull up anyone's slides. Great. Uh, so, let's give Rosa another hand for all that awesome research and info you've been doing. Thank you. So, next up, we're going to call up uh, Deborah Basio, who's a lead, the lead soil scientist for the Nature Conservancy. And again, you're going to have about six and a half minutes to kind of pitch your idea. And if you're just joining, the frame is um, imagining as if these are like pitches to people who would invest money in those policies. And so that's, that's sort of like a pitch. So that's the, the framing. Hi. Thank you all for coming. Welcome. The session, I'm here to talk about soil organic carbon, soil carbon sequestration. Uh, it was one of the, the items already mentioned by Linny as sort of an under, not yet included uh, in how we're looking at agricultural mitigation, and that's why it's so important for us to think about it today. It's a, a topic close to my heart. I've been working in soil science for decades, but it's not just me that's excited about soil carbon. Uh, last year, the, the Cap Per Mill initiative was launched. Um, at, at the COP last year, now over 150 governments and organizations have signed on. And this initiative's primary goal is to raise the profile of the importance of soil for both food security and for climate change mitigation. So a lot of people are talking about this, and the question now is how do we, how do we move forward? And why are we talking about this? First, because the, 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 sor the, sink of the, the stock of carbon in soil is twi two or three times larger than that in, in the atmosphere, meaning that the possible for putting, so putting carbon into the atmosphere from soil as a source or putting it back into the soil as a sink is very, very large. So that's why people are suddenly getting much more excited about this um, underappreciated aspect. The other thing that's very important is that soil organic carbon has multiple benefits food production, uh, water, clean water, um, creating resilience and adaptation in farming systems, uh, and also the climate mitigation uh, potential of it. Um, and what the Cap Per Mill is promoting is the idea that if we, all, if we halt land use change emissions, that soil 
could absorb the remaining um, fossil fuel emissions that are not yet absorbed by land and ocean uh, sources. So that it is quite big potential with an aspirational, completely aspirational target of 3.5 gigatons uh, carbon per year. Now we need to go much further beyond this kind of aspirational talk and see, but one of the really big questions in science was, okay, but what really could we do? What could we achieve and where would we achieve it? Uh, because agricultural lands are the ones that we're actively managing, that's going to be the area where we can most quickly start to make changes in what's happening in the soil carbon pool. So we did a recent analysis to sort of look at this scenario that if you blanketed all agricultural lands, so the, the colored parts you hear are only farmed agricultural lands, not pasture lands even. If you blanketed agricultural lands with um, uh, practices that would enhance carbon sequestration, what could we really get and where would you maybe see it? You see here um, uh, the big numbers we get if we use what people know about known practices now. So this is based on realistic numbers of known practices. Um, you could get between 0.9 and, and 1.8 uh, petagrams of carbon per year in the top 30 centimeters of the soil. And you see some real hot spots, for example, in, the, in North America, in the Corn Belt, in Europe, uh, and in India. And this is primarily because the, it's a combination between where we're doing intensive agriculture, where there's going to be 60, 70, 80 percent agricultural use of those lands, that's where we're going to be also having the most potential to sequester the carbon. Now you might ask, okay, after this, but why, what would we be doing? What are the actual practices that would be contributing to this? And one message I want to convey here is this really isn't business as usual, because we do have these practices and we know that they can sequester carbon. Agroforestry, we're going to be talking about agroecological practices like using cover crops and crop rotations, rangeland management, conservation tillage. But to actually achieve the kind of targets we're talking about, first you're going to have to get large-scale rollout of these practices, very large-scale, and you might also be having to push the envelope on what practices can achieve <coughs> by combining practices. And one that I really like to point out that we're not doing very much yet is this recycling of organic materials, working much more at this rural-urban interface where we have so much pollution and so much organic materials and nutrients polluting our systems from the cities. We need to bring that back to the land as part of our strategies. There are some caveats I'd like to mention right up front before anyone brings it up. Uh, Large-scale rollout will take time. That means we can't achieve the, the possible benefits immediately. It will take time as we implement practices over, over the landscape. So you can see another analysis we did a couple years ago would show that there's a phased implementation of rollout um, before you achieve the, the actual goal that we would like to see. And then, because soils have finite capacities to store carbon, within about 20 years we would also start to see a decrease in the annual sequestration. But we would still need to maintain the practices to maintain what's in the ground in the ground. So permanence is a big, a big concern here. Uh, and um, monitoring is also a Monitoring is also a question, but this is where I see soil carbon as a very important entry point because it is a single point that you can monitor um, as opposed to some of the other more, more broad-based practice uh, changes. So what I want to pitch is, is how would we get here? So we have the idea what we want. We want to change agricultural practices. And then we have an idea what we can get. We can come up with these global numbers all the time. It's actually quite easy. You know, uh, how much we want to get the one giga uh, or, or, or petagram of, of carbon per year, but how are we going to actually get there? I think that's where we need to, to put our investment money. And this is one example of what the Nature Conservancy is doing. We're looking at transforming half of Northern, North America's agricultural lands to soil conserving and soil carbon enhancing practices. And the way we plan to get there is to address the issues in science, which has to do with how do you monitor and understand soil health. An entry point that's interesting to the farmers who who manage the land, which is soil health and productivity, not climate change is the main entry point. We look at the economic aspects, including really interesting ones like, uh, even in the US, it's tenant farmers who are forming 60% of the land. How do you get to align the interests of even the landholder with the tenant farmers who are in short-term thinkers about how they manage land towards these long-term goals? So this is a major thing that will be addressed in this in this roadmap, uh, as well as providing agricultural um, services that support carbon enhancing practices, which today they do not. And then also the policy aspects. I think that this type of roadmap would be equally relevant in other countries uh, and would be a way that we could think about going about achieving the goals in carbon, soil carbon sequestration. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Deborah. So um, next up, we're going to call up um, Louis Verschot, Verschot uh, who is the director of soils research at um, CIAT, which is the Centro Internacional, Internacional Centro de Agricultura. Mm. <laughs> I'm messing it up. I wanted to do it in Spanish. The International Center on um, Tropical, Tropical Agriculture. Agriculture. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, this seems tricky, so maybe I need some training. <laughs> I, I, that's the forward button. Oh, the one that goes backwards. Yeah, oh, I turn it around. Turn it, there you go. <laughs> but, and, oh, and the pointer's there? Okay, good. All right, I got it. Good. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the livestock sector. Oh, wait. Is this the wrong one? Oh, I hope this. Ah, I just forgot to change the front slide. I have another presentation on my board of trustees this evening. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about, a bit about the livestock sector and the potential for, for mitigation in the livestock sector. And let's start with the magnitude of the problem. There are 17 billion livestock worldwide. This, this is everything from, from, from cattle to guinea pigs, or camels to guinea pigs, if we go by size, right? Um, so so there's, there's a huge number of, of animals that humans are keeping to, to maintain their, their food system. Um, about 67%, or about 5 billion hectares of agricultural land is used to feed these animals. And this includes 3.4 billion hectares of grazing land. So it's, it's huge. It's, it's much larger than croplands. Um, much of this land has been severely degraded by overgrazing and unsustainable production, particularly in the tropics. Um, and uh, livestock generate about 7.1 billion tons of CO2 equivalent annually. This includes deforestation for the expansion of, of grazing lands and pastures. Um, and it's about 15% of all human greenhouse gas emissions. So we've been working on, on an initiative at, at SEAT called Livestock Plus. And Livestock Plus involves a number of things. It says laser. It work. All right, doesn't okay, doesn't work. Very good. So good, good policies and strong institutions um, integrated with with well-managed tropical forage-based systems and access to markets is working to improve livelihoods um, through profitable livestock production. Right, and this is this this livestock plus initiative is really about how do we change management to improve people's livelihoods, okay, and to reduce the environmental hoofprint of the livestock. Isn't that cute? Hoofprint, right, <laughs> of, of livestock. Um, so we have uh, um, the technical innovations and intensification process is, is genetic, it's ecological, it's socioeconomic. Um, and this works to create benefits in, in terms of products, but also services, um, the, the ecosystem services, as well as the, 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 the livestock-based products. Through the integration of crop and livestock, for example, in, in the Llanos in, in Colombia, on some of these acid soils, if we go from a native savanna um, to, to uh, an improved pasture, we can significantly increase live weight gain from about 27 uh, uh, kilograms per, per hectare per year in, in um, the, 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 the natural rangeland systems to over 1,000 kilograms per hectare per year in intensively managed um, uh, pasture systems. Okay? And there's a whole range of, of intermediates along the way, um, in, including uh, crop, uh, crop and livestock, uh, uh, crop and pasture um, rotations. The outcomes that this produces are several. First of all, on, on the lower part of the, of the lower uh, panel over here, there's, there are a whole series of Brachiaria humidicola varieties that SEAT has been developing that actually inhibit nitrification. There is a, a chemical produced in the root system that, that um, <coughs> inhibits nitrification, and we're currently working in breeding this, this um, uh, 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 trait into other varieties of, of uh, Brachiaria. There's, there's something specific in the genetics. It probably can't go to other varieties like Panicum or, or, or other species like Panicum or, or, or other uh, species. But, but within the Brachiarias, we should be able to breed this trait. Um, and on, on the right-hand side, since I don't have a pointer, I will point like this. This is the high, in, the, the high bio ni biological nitrification inhibition variety. And you can see it significantly reduces um, nitrous oxide production, which is one of the major um, uh, pollutants from, from agriculture. This is compared to a control, compared to some crops, and compared to several other um, types of, of pasture systems. Um, so we can, we, through proper variety selection and breeding, we can probably reduce the, the, the nitrous oxide emissions from these systems. And it's not just the nitrification in the soil, or the, the nitrous oxide produced in the soil, but also the nitrous oxide produced in, in, in the, the dung and urine patches. Um, and, and so this is a significant source in the tropics. We can increase carbon stocks in these soils. So if we're, if we're going from a, a, a native um, um, uh, 
grazing land, or rangeland, or a degraded rangeland, we can significantly increase the, the, the carbon stored in the soils on the order of going from, say, like um, uh, 74 to, to around 100 under um, uh, natural systems up to, to almost 150 um, in the, the, the uh, uh, intensive systems. And these re it's really through these root systems, which, which can be quite dense in brachiaria. The final point is that introducing legumes into these pastures, which improves the, the, the nutrition of the, the livestock, it, it accelerates live weight gain. We can do this without increasing methane production by enteric fermentation. We don't reduce it. The animal produces the same, but the animal grows much faster. So we reduce the intensity, uh, the methane intensity of, of the, the, the crops. So we're hitting all of the, the three major gases associated with agriculture. We're, we're improving the carbon situation in these landscapes, we're reducing the nitrous oxide, and we're, we're reducing the methane intensity of the livestock. And, and that is the reason to think, consider investing in, in this technology and, and this approach. And, and I, I insist it's a holistic approach, it's not just a technology, and it's really putting livelihoods at the center of, of the, 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 the system that we're trying to promote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So our fourth presenter is going to be Henry Neufeldt, who is the head of climate change, the climate change unit of the World Agroforestry Center. Thanks, Henry. Okay. So let's see if I can manipulate this. I'll be talking about trees on farms. Um, Trees on farms, or agroforestry in a more general term, um, is a technology, it's a, it's a lively, it's a practice, agricultural practice, that includes trees in agricultural landscapes. And there are multiple ways in which this happens. Now, a couple of years past, uh, Lini talked, was, was referring to this paper that she wrote in assessing the mitigation potential of different technologies in agriculture. And in that context, I estimated uh, for this work, based on uh, a paper that Bob Zomer and a friend and colleagues had done recently, oops, that's wrong, um, what the mitigation potential of agroforestry might be globally. And then, based on these numbers, Bob and I talked about it, and then we developed this paper that was recently published here in Science Reports that shows that um, agroforestry, trees on farms globally. We looked at the overall distribution of agriculture and the covers of trees on these landscapes and estimated that uh, with the biomass that different landscapes produce. And based on these numbers, we came up with the, the estimate that over the past 10 years, agroforestry or trees on farms or uh, biomass on agricultural lands have produced 0 0.7 gigatons of CO2 equivalent mitigation, right? That's huge. That's like two-thirds of what Lini was talking about. This is only agriculture, uh, carbon dioxide, which means it's a finite uh, greenhouse gas. It will be renewed. It, that is, when, we, when trees are felled, of course, we lose this potential. But um, if we continue expanding what we can see agroforestry being possible of doing, then there, this provides a huge mitigation potential that contributes to uh, addressing agriculture's role in uh, the production of greenhouse gases. And what we also saw in this fine-scale analysis, which is on, based on a one-by-one-kilometer grid, is that in different regions we see different dynamics, trends. So this is Latin America, and you can see in the Cerrado region there is a, a massive increase in <coughs> biomass on agricultural soils over the past 10 years, whereas in Argentina we see a re the reverse. Or let's look at Africa, I'm not sure you can see it. There are uh, several countries like Sierra Leone, Guinea, Cameroon, Nigeria, Tanzania, Equatorial Guinea, that are losing massive amounts of tree biomass in the landscape, whereas Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and Madagascar are increasing. Or let's look at Southeast Asia. 
massive increase in Indonesia, and some countries like Myanmar are losing very strongly. These examples are just here to show you that we need to look closer. We can't use these analyses, which give us an indication of what is possible to define policies and to invert trends where we see a decline in carbon stocks, which then leads to uh, the contribution of greenhouse gases and, and climate change. So we know that agroforestry contributes to mitigation, but actually, as a system, it's much, much more than that. It's a system that provides massive amounts of ecosystem services, uh, soil fertility, um, insulation, water protection, erosion control, and in, in higher densities, uh, biodiversity increase. It improves farmers' livelihoods uh, through diversification of products. It uh, provides income in the context of market accessibility. And uh, it also increases the resilience to climate shocks because we've seen in, in res research that uh, by planting trees on farms, Farmers are able to reduce their climate risks, food insecurity, by around a quarter. By one month, in a, in a region where we saw um, that during a drought and flooding, farmers were losing uh, over, over a month uh, extra in addition to their farm food insecurity. And, and agroforestry was contributing to that. So we can see that this system is able to improve farmers' livelihoods and we need to scale it up. We need to find out what the drivers are that are leading to large-scale degradation. And we need to do that through uh, regionally more looking more, uh, more closely at the regional scale diverse, diversity. And then identifying these changes. Look at what are, what are the policy drivers, what are the market drivers that are leading to either a positive trend or, or negative trends. And um, then we need to measure the social, economic, political, and environmental dimensions of these changes in these regions. And that's the pitch. I want to use the money that this, that this uh, panel of dragons has to find out in six different hotspot regions what we're going to do and how we're going to do it over the next 10 years. Thank you very much. All right, let's give it up again for our four panelists who have um, just given so much time and energy in their lives to researching these solutions as scientists. Thank you all. Um, just speaking as a young American, I have more hope um, in you all than in really anyone in our government uh, at <laughs> this time, really. So uh, I'm going to call up Nate now to facilitate the next part of this. Uh, cool. Thanks very much, Daniel. That was great. So now we have the Dragon's Den part. And we have four very prestigious and powerful dragons who've been saving up dragon fire for the last half an hour. Um, so I will begin by calling them up. Uh, Nazir Fued, who is leading the Indonesian peatland restoration program. It's initiated by the president of Indonesia. Uh, he is working across 13 million hectares of land with a target to restore at least 2.5 million hectares in this area and uh, with a commitment over, of over $125 million. Uh, Nazir, please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, these dragons are very powerful, so I have to make sure I get my notes right. Uh, Sonia Rumula, who is an international scientist with the Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security, CCAFs. And Sonia is representing research into practical solutions for smallholder farmers under climate change, aiming to reach at least 10 million farmers in the next 10 years. Sonia, thank you. We have Anna Lehman, who is the Vice President of Policy at Climate Markets and Investment Association. She's representing investors and project developers in mitigation and adaptation with approximately $400 million under asset management, of which $200 million is in sustainable land use and policy. Thank you. And we have Evan uh, Giritz, who is a senior scientist with SEAT, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. And Evan is working with investment planning and development partners such as the World Bank 
and he also sits on the steering committee of the African Climate Smart Agricultural Alliance to scaling up climate smart agricultural solutions to six million farmer, uh, farming families. So how this next session will work, uh, each of the dragons will, will provide some dragon fire, some critical feedback uh, to the four pitches that you've just heard. We will then um, hear if there's any positive feedback. The questions, the dragons will, if there's anything positive, they may or may not have. Um, they will then, they'll also talk you know, along the lines of you know, the most promising in terms of their context. Um, they can think, and I'll help them with this, the trade-offs what might be missing, and how to take these forward and scale them out. Then we will go, and then they will also decide. They each have $50 million. They've promised me that this money is waiting just outside of the gates here uh, in trucks, which they will then deliver to whichever of the four they think is the most promising of these four pitches. And then we'll go to the audience for some questions. And, uh, and then we'll actually ask the audience. We actually have arranged $50 million for each of the audience members to invest here as well. And we'll ask you where, we'll do a vote to see where you would put your money. So, Nazir, um, may I start with you? Thank you, Nat. Um, good morning, everybody. Yes, uh, how, how many minutes do I have? Net? Um, maybe t about two minutes, two, three minutes. Just well, to, yeah. okay. well, first, um, of course, there is no single um, solution. We have to look on the uh, various paths that would strengthen each other of these four uh, concepts. Uh, for example, um, I would look uh, on social issues of the farmers. I would look on the consumption. Uh, in this case, for example, beef or another food uh, chain, and also look on the uh, the potentials of the carbon uh, that can be reduced. Um, on the pitland, uh, I agree that it has a great potentials. I would like to know on uh, the situation because now on Earth we see some pitland which are still intact in many countries. But also, we see a lot of pitlands you have been drained, uh, drained and managed to some degree because they have uh, legitimate landowners and managers trying their best. But also, they are drained area which is very badly managed, and there are areas which are having conflict between landowners A, B, and C, and uh, is going down the drain. So, what would be the uh, strategy on of those different uh, uh, scenarios. Um, on the drain areas that improvement can be made, of course, it would be great to link it with the uh, agroforestry practices or paludiculture culture on how the uh, farmers, the landowners, the communities on that area uh, can get engaged in restoring the peatland, so reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions while also uh, producing uh, food and so on. Now, I would like to also, s so it, it have a great link with the agroforestry, the trees on farm. And I would like to also uh, um, look on the increased uh, beef intake in, in the world with a lot of new emerging countries. I think that is the scenario we cannot avoid. Uh, the beef consumptions in many countries are uh, increasing um, uh, greatly, uh, like in China, also uh, some countries in, in, in Africa are coming up. And that is the issue we have to deal with. Uh, but I would like to know, I'd like to get more information um, from you, Louis, on what kind of scale that can be done to, uh, in uh, different, also geographics, um, and uh, what kind of a policy uh, will be coming out of that exercise of which government and investment uh, communities uh, can also uh, adapt themselves. So with only seven minutes I have from the pictures, it is quite hard to uh, make the decisions. I would like to have another session to go with every one of them, like half an hour, uh, to talk more. So at this stage, uh, well, I have to say that I have great interest to talk more in the details uh, with you, Louis, on the beef and the strategy uh, with uh, 
Rosa, yeah, with Rosas on the different scenarios of the intact pit, hardly degraded, badly degraded, uh, and some land, uh, land managers who are uh, on top of it, uh, and with uh, Henry, uh, particularly on the agroforestry, that can uh, go uh, with that. Maybe at the lower parity with Debbie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nazir. Thank you very much. Excellent. And we'll, we will give um, each of the panels a, a minute to respond sort of at the end, just before we go back as well, just in case they have any comments for the dragons. Uh, Sonia, your dragonfire, I assume the, the panelists have their armor ready. Uh, well, at, at the beginning of the session, I was planning to be Puff the friendly dragon. Um, <laughs> Puff, um, but... I do feel that as an investor, I need to know what I'm going to get from my invest investment. And I really didn't get that from any of the four pitches at all. So the, for me, the burning issue with um, mitigation in the land and agriculture sectors is that the mitigation benefit is a global public good, but what we're trying to do is harness private action to deliver that. So really what I was hoping for from the pitches were some strong arguments around the kinds of incentives that we could be providing for individual farmers, for uh, companies within their supply chains to kind of drive delivery of, of, of that public good. So to go through one by one, Rosa, sorry, definitely at the bottom, you presented the problem. Um, there's, uh, you know, Peat stocks around the world are immense. They're incredibly valuable to us as humanity. You didn't tell me anything that we could really do to, to improve that in the future. I didn't, I didn't even find out technically what we might be doing, let alone how you then bring in the economics and the incentives around that. Moving next to, to Louis, I, th I thought you had some great technical pictures in there. I also really did like the way that you looked beyond uh, the purely mitigation benefits to thinking about how livestock operates holistically, um, both, both uh, at the farm level, but also for us as society. But nonetheless, I, I didn't feel that I was getting the sense of you know, why would farmers now be wanting to expand their brachiaria uh, plantings and their pasture or something like that? So it, my feedback to you would be to be taking that to the next level around, around some of those incentives there. Henry, you were next. Um, you, you definitely went much further when you were presenting, for example, in the Evergreen Agriculture. You didn't, you didn't talk about it, but it was up there on the screen about some of the actual models that you'd get for... Uh, a, you gave, there were examples from across West Africa of the actual institutional ways that farmers have been encouraged to scale up this massive tree planting. That's great. It's kind of getting to where, where we wanted. At the end, you did say you wanted to spend my $50 million on finding out what to do, <laughs> which was a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> so that takes me on to Debbie, who is definitely getting my 50 million bucks. Um, <laughs> Debbie, uh, you did have a good roadmap there. You were really thinking about the incentives for the individual landowners. You weren't necessarily saying what they were yet, but you were drawing attention to the use of the whole market to provide the kind of market signals um, uh, and enabled by policy that, that we're going to need at, at a global level. So your pitch didn't go as far as I wanted, but definitely was going uh, more in that direction of how do we incentivize large-scale private action to create global public goods? Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Wow, that's some, sort of some smoke in the room, I feel. Uh, we may need to open up a window. Uh, fantastic. And Anna, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that made me shiver. Um, <laughs> I don't want to pitch anything ever to you. <laughs> we, we've scared the dragons. The dragons are scared. Okay. No, but it's, it, it's right. You, know, you, you pointed it all out. But you know, if, if we talk about leveraging private sector capital, we need to think about revenue streams, right? How, do you, how are you going to pay back that loan, whether that's coming through you know, a bond? We've heard lots about you know, forest bonds and these kind of things coming up. It's just a way to package debt, you know? It's, it's ultimately somebody gives you money and you gotta pay it back, so how are you gonna do that? Um, that's one of the key questions everybody will have to answer. But, um, but I think for certain products, I mean, we, we do have, 
a problem because we can't value the the well we we can't assign a value to peatlands for example if I'm starting now with Rosa. Um, you know, we all sense and know that they're extremely relevant for us, and we do know we we should keep them in the ground, and we should we should keep growing them again. But um, how help us to assign a value to those so that also you know at a decentralized level um, that local governments and national governments understand what is the value and what are what is the value of the ecosystem services that those peatlands deliver, so that they can include that in their um, you know potentially natural capital accounting methods that um, they might be thinking about, that they can also start assigning costs to certain activities that reduce the delivery of those services. Extremely important for us to, to start working with. Um, moving over to Deborah. Yeah, I can't, can't stress enough, you know, this is really, this really, um, I think it's, you know, you, you really hit the, hit the nail on the head there. This is, it's so important to start speaking about mainstreaming of um, soil conservation practices, you know, especially in high intensity agricultural production systems. And by targeting the US and especially the Midwest, you're going where you have to go. So, you know, the 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 ambition is great and if 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 you succeed, we will we will succeed on the planet. Because, you know, but but you know, I hope you've got a you've got a warm coat, right? Because <laughs> If you, what you <laughs> people you'll have to start talking to is the fertilizer industry, basically. You've got to break that myth that um, nitrogen fertilizer is the solution to save the planet and to produce the food of the world, right? This is, there's lots of people in the world that do believe that. And on the back of, or especially after the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, um, when land became a very, you know, much more traded asset, um, the fertilizer industry capitalized on that and started building new plants. They haven't been written off. They, those guys want to still make money and they're still going to keep telling you, honey, this is not going to feed our world, right? And you need to be, you do need to be ready for that. And if you need friends, then come talk to us. Um, <laughs> but it's, gone, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Although, but the link to recycling, extremely important. And I think there are technologies out there and there is, you know, sort of business cases is, is hard. Um, in Germany, we have a relatively good uh, recycling infrastructure where we try to do that, to take organic waste from households and bring them back onto lands. Um, they're publicly funded. So, you know, um, the investment case, I'm not seeing it very clearly, but I do see and I do sense that we need to address that. Speak about, you know, true costs to fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. That might be the way to <coughs> go forward, though, because um, it's highly subsidized. As we all know, it's highly energy intensive. Um, natural nitrogen fertilizer reservoirs in Chile are running out. So, you know, those products should actually have, a, you know, the true price should be allocated to those. And that might make also create a more level playing field for um, composting and recycling technologies. So, yeah, spot on there. Um, not investable yet, but, you know, we'll follow you. Um, Louis, meat, of course, you know, is one of those um, products that we'll have to start looking at. So it's, it's extremely relevant, I think, what you do. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about, you know, wh at what scale is the research, what lengths, you know, or what, what time series, timelines do you actually have, and what, what scale in terms of rolling out, um, uh, do you have sort of, is, is that already in an investable phase that you can take this forward, any other socio-economic um, criteria we should take into consideration is it a really is it a new crop is it genetically modified um, is it something that actually fits into the um, the the cropping cycles um, you know any any other impact really important for us to understand because we're quite nervous about introducing something new somewhere else that might not be you know working on the long run so I um, haven't bought into yet entirely but of course protein demand is very high and we need to think of more sustainable ways of, of producing meat really. Um, Henry, agroforestry, yes, uh, and all those, you know, diversifying production systems, generally speaking, very important, but um, I think uh, so far we still need to, you know, there's, there's much to do in getting the investment environment right for, for those kind of production systems. So we need um, very basic things, we spoke, you know, land use rights and certainty on, 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 on the fact that, or for the fact that those little investments um, will be actually also, uh, well, will be directed to areas where communities and where people have rights to their land and will be able to um, 
able to produce there continuously, that's extremely important, and building market infrastructure. And also when you look at markets, look at domestic markets, don't just look at the world market. You know, world markets can be quite hostile things, um, but how do you produce something? How do you store something? Where do you store it? Where do you get the energy storage, uh, the, the energy to, to keep that product cool and to transport it to the nearest markets? Um, give us some ideas around that and maybe you know the infrastructure investment around that will actually deliver then the revenue rather than the product itself. And yeah, that's that's it. I'll leave it there. Anna, sorry, last question. I'll push you. Where would you put your money? Where I put my money? <laughs> right, I did. Um, you know, as as a yeah, as a very bad investor, I would. Uh, it's got to go with the meat. Wow. Well, okay. Great. Thank you, Evan. Okay. Um, I'll I'll say that from 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 a, a, a high level, uh, I'm I was very excited by everything that I saw that was presented. Feeling like there's a lot of potential opportunity, uh, a lot that can be done. But then I think everything that the, the dragon so far, uh, the, the smoke that's been blown, I, I completely agree with. And to me, it's about, as an investor, where is the return on, on what I would get? And how does this really work um, on the ground? Uh, again, at the high level, I think the numbers are there. In, in most cases, I think there's there's some, um, maybe Lou in particular with the, the livestock, seeing what brachiaria, what kind of forages could do at the, at the global level, which I saw in the others, kind of putting the, the scale of the solution um, out there w would be nice to see. Um, but then feeling like, how do the communities come in? How do the people who are actually going to be implementing this on the ground come in? Uh, what's the, the business model that really works uh, to, to, to get them the incentives there, to really get them uh, to implement what needs to be implemented on the ground? And then the accountability so that as an investor, uh, I, get, I get my money back uh, in, in the end. Um, uh, going through each uh, quickly, the, the, the peatlands, um, I mean, it seems like a very important issue, certainly. It clearly is. Um, but then what is what is that business model? One of the things that came up to me was um, it seemed like some of these areas, and I don't know all of them from the global map, but there can be conflict there. There's how do you know really what's going on on the ground? How do you monitor, th monitor this? How do you ensure that uh, what you're promoting is, is actually going to happen? And engaging the communities there, I think, uh, is, is very important. Uh, with the, the Livestock Plus, uh, the Forages Brachiaria, um, the the delivery mechanism of the uh, of the forages to the farmer, uh, the adoption of the farmer, getting them to, to actually want to to plant that. Um, how do you turn that in into a a, a market itself in, in terms of uh, the value chain of the of the forage uh, itself? Um, uh, Deborah, I really like the the roadmap. I think uh, to me of everything that I saw, I'll say I think that was the the most compelling as far as at least all the pieces I think were there in terms of what needs to be done, not that it's ready necessarily right now, bankable, but uh, I like the pieces and I think the others uh, um, could, could, could come there. But I think there's a lot of questions uh, in terms of uh, even in the US getting large farmers to change what they do, they're already doing uh, the thing, they have the money, it's not like they, they, they I mean, presumably they have the money to be able to, to, to do what's profitable to them, so it's about turning the incentives uh, to to uh, get them to do what, what we want them to do. Um, and uh, Henry with agroforestry, uh, I think uh, a, a lot of opportunity there, um, but again, it's, uh, I think of uh, the discount rate in terms of when you plant something, when do you get the, the, uh, the value back, the return on the investment from both the, the farmer and uh, the investor. Um, again, what are the business models there that would work uh, for, for an investor and seeing s some more about that? Um, but I think uh, certainly more to be pursued there. And to me, if I were to end, I would say what I was saying about the, what uh, Deborah the, from the soils uh, carbon perspective presented in terms of that roadmap, if that could be brought into all of these. And in some ways, I would like to put my money into developing that in, in all of these and then seeing, keeping, keeping the rest in, in some uh, safe bonds. And when I see <laughs> the business model, then I'll invest. But I think right now I'll go with uh, the, the soil carbon for uh, what, what was proposed. Great, thank you very much. So now we have approximately 15 minutes where we'd like to do some participation from the audience, really get your feedback and thoughts and questions. So we'll open questions up to, of course, the dragons, but also um, to the panelists. I, I don't know, would the panelists like a minute to respond or you think we're okay to jump to questions? I think we'll just jump to questions um, because either, otherwise I think we'll get into too much of a, a back and forth. So we'll save that for lunch. So. Some questions from the audience. 
Do we have anybody with some questions? Great, we've got one. If somebody could help me run a mic. Dave, would you mind? Sure. That'd be great. Thank you so much. You can just shout too. Uh, I think we're, it's being recorded. So we've got the great. Right. Could you just uh, give us your name and organization, please? Yes, uh, Danush Dinesh from CCAFs. Uh, as an investor, I'm uh, just a bit worried about the risk of my investment. So I'm sort of wondering like, what the climate risks would be. You know, For instance, if uh, investing in agroforestry, it, it, it works in the present climate, but what does the future climate hold for it? If I'm looking at a 10, 15, 20 year timeline and in that geography, is there going to be increased temperature or what changes are predicted and how risky is my investment uh, in those contexts. And that would probably apply to some of the other uh, examples as well. Great, thank you. We'll take a couple questions at once. So I've got over here, um, and I'll give you that one. So Henry, if you could bank that one for agroforestry, and we'll pass that around as well. Thank you. Jason Funk from the Center for Carbon Removal, sort of piggybacking on that topic, I, I think. Um, I mean, this is a super interesting and fun exercise, and uh, I appreciate this approach to thinking about how we can, uh, you know, stimulate investment. Uh, it struck me that, I mean, and all of these initiatives I thought were amazing and, and worth supporting. One of the things that occurred to me during the event was that, you know, we have these different perspectives on the risks. Um, I think their investors are going to have a different risk tolerance and profile than the people we're asking to actually do these practices. And particularly when we're thinking about smallholder farmers and ones who are the most vulnerable, they really can't afford to take on very much risk. So there's one, you know, this is their livelihood, these are their families. That disconnect in risk tolerance is something that I think is an area worth looking into and figuring out how can we manage that risk and not put more of the risk onto the people we're asking to do these particular practices. And that might be uh, itself a thing to think about for um, financial instruments to try to address. Great, thank you. And I, I think I come him next, and then I'll come over to this side. I'll just do these first three. Tim Tenikait from Unique Forest and Land Use. I have first a question, what kind of investment we are talking about? Is it public, private? What is the risk return profile is expected? So this is one question we have to keep in mind. Secondly, I feel all these uh, propositions are not mutually exclusive. And when you think about an investment, you make either an investment in um, an organization, a person, you know they deliver because they have a track record, or you have to see the, the, the project on the ground, the investment type, where all these things can come together. Then if we are talking about the, the on-the-ground activities, it's always a question again, if it's smallholder, how are they brought together? How are they linked through the value chain? Are they linked through uh, community organizations? And if it's, 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 if it's large investors or landowners to, to see what long-term sustainability perspective they have. So, so my gut feeling is at the moment it would be very difficult to, to decide where to put the money, but I, I, I thought the, the responses were already clear and straight, and I think this is very helpful for the discussion, what are the open points that need to be addressed. Great, thank you. I'm going to stop there, and then we'll, we'll capture the other two questions that I've got over here, and, and maybe some more. And you know, I see some more hands going up, and I'm just cognizant of time. So I'm going to direct those, instead of asking everybody to respond, but just to some key people here. So Henry, could you fill the first one? Uh, thank you. So Danush, Thanks for, for raising that issue, and I believe that it's not only relevant for agroforestry, um, the, the fact that uh, changing climates in the future will affect the, the, the crops, the, the pastures, uh, the, the trees that we're working in. I pr presume that trees might be more uh, sustainable or sort of resilient to climate shocks in their own right because they, to a lesser degree, depend on uh, irrigation and so I think the answer here would be that we need to look at every case um, situation and find the right trees for the right place or the right crop or the right pasture for the right place and to see how that uh, plays out in the future and our expectations around uh, climate change but I'd like to also sort of say a few words about the investor risk and um, I appreciate in particular, Sonia's uh, rebuff of not having spoken about the 
the institutional and the policy frameworks um, for time reasons, I must admit, that it's we do need to look at every place in a specific way. And if we want to see the change that we were in uh, envisaging, we can't just come across with a, with a one-size-fits-all approach. And that's, that's the main message here. And that's why I think it's important that we go to the ground and find these hotspots <laughs> of, of change and identify what needs to be done there. And then that's when we're talking about the smallholder farmers. What are their risks? What, how can we ensure that they adopt these measures? And that's not, a, that's not an easy answer. We don't have a, a single answer for that right away, and certainly not in seven minutes. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Debbie, did you want to? I wanted to say something about this investor topic. Sure. Because um, the roadmap that I presented, actually there's the more complete summary of the roadmap on the cat per mil table, because I didn't cover so many of the details you guys were asking for. But it's a very, very elaborate roadmap developed with dozens of stakeholders in that particular place. And in the US, we're looking at private company investors. General Mills invested in developing the roadmap in the first place. and. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, incentive structures switched through through changing the insurance um, regime. So that would be sort of uh, that would also be the private sector changing the way it incentivized farmers through changing the way insurance, farm insurance was was produced. And that's very much a U.S. sort of a model through that type of investment uh, and and through legal frameworks that would help uh, um, farmers, uh, you know, the land users who are not the land owners actually get some benefit through changing their practices. So this is much more of a private investment sort of, a, a, of, of an entry point for the US. And that may not be appropriate at all for smallholder farmers in Kenya or Tanzania. So I think it really does depend on the situation. But the elements of a roadmap, understanding the incentives for farmers, and understanding what science is totally lacking and the policy that's lacking to support those incentives, I think that's sort of a more generic roadmap that could be used regardless of who's investing. Great, thanks. I know we've got some other questions. You wanted to briefly, and I just great. And just if you could just be quick as possible. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll be very quick. So I mean, there, there was the, the the question about the the long term sustainability of a lot of these solutions f as we we were confronted with climate change, and that's certainly an issue we need to take take into account. Um, if you're talking about the 10 to 15 to 20 year time horizon, we actually need a different type of analysis than what science is routinely producing, which is you know horizon 2070 or, or horizon 2100. And and we're only now starting to get to this medium term variability. Um, the, for example, the, the Western Amazon is probably 10 years into a 30-year drying cycle right now. These things have not been really worked out well. Even in the IPCC reports, we're, we're, you know, we, we, need, we have different approaches coming on from the downscaling of GCMs, and we're now getting to the point where science can actually begin to provide some of those insights. And, and, and hopefully, investors will be in now approaching the scientists and trying to, to understand what we're doing on, on those aspects to, to be able to factor that in. You know, th this whole thing is, you know, I think asking scientists to produce the whole business case and, and, and dealing with some of, of Tim's market, uh, comments on, on the different perspectives is really important. We are probably not the best people to make the business case because we're not investors. We don't have the eye of an investor in the types of analysis we're doing. The return on investment depends upon where you are. In, you know, in, in, in the, 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 the Amazon in Colombia or the Llanos in, in Colombia, the returns on investment are going to be different. And so we, we, I think we need more of a partnership with our, 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 our colleagues in, in the financial industry to put these issues together. We can bring in the, you know, when, when you want to know about climate variability, we say, well, here's what science can tell us, here's what science can't tell us. We, here we can help you reduce your uncertainty at this level. You know, tell us where the, 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 the highest uncertainty is to, to make this an investable program, and then we can go back and, and, and work on, on our data and, and, and try and, and, and develop that, those knowledge products. So this is where I think we need the partnership, and, and that's where we're going to make this connection on the, the points that Tim raised with the difference in perspectives in tolerance for risk is, 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 is being able to reduce that risk at, at, across the board for the different types of people we're asking to do things differently. Fantastic. Thanks. I've got three more questions, which probably a dozen more here, but I'll go to Michael first. Hi, Michael Hovel from Marchment Communications. Um, as scientists, I imagine you're mostly concerned about sort of learning and keeping up with a changing context. So I was wondering if you had any insights, any of you, about how you handle the constant learning versus the doing what we already know. So the sort of the feedback from w what we know versus how you actually do it and how you balance that. And as scientists, is that your job, or is it your job to just inform other groups to do it, and how that works? Great. So if you guys could bank that, and uh, I'll ask for a volunteer in a moment. 
Uh, thank you. I'm Lawrence from Uganda, a member of parliament and also chairperson of the Parliamentary Forum on Climate Change. Should we focus on soil carbon in peatland or we should focus on pollinators? Because most farmers are getting discouraged because of low yield, because of lack of pollinators, because we are promoting more of crop farming. I, I, I need that answer. Number two is what role do you think the policymakers can play because they're involved in legislation, budgeting, and also oversight? Thank you. Great, thank you. And I've got one over here. I have more of a quick comment than a question. Um, while I think this is really fun to have this sort of format uh, for a session and much more exciting than many other sessions I've attended, I just want us to be aware that investment is only one way to uh, change landscapes and that looking through the investment lens for me it also poses certain challenges because it puts a big pressure, big profit pressure on any kind of project in order to be able to repay and that might not be the best approach for all sorts of all kind of measures that can be taken. Well, that's what I just want us to all be aware that, that that also has some sort of threats related to it. There we go. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, Maybe I'll let everyone think for a second. Anna, do you want to just speak on that profit pressure? On just that one, the, yes. the, la the last one? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, you know? I mean, this is where my heart is. I wish we just wouldn't speak about money and just about, you know, the value of landscape for all of us. But sadly, the world does not work like that at the moment, you know? And, and if we just, I mean, I don't really know where to start, but for example, um, just looking at how fast land acquisitions are taking place. And not just foreign, but also domestic, larger companies come into countries, just purchase land, you know, and, and governments issue concessions. And that goes at a tremendous speed, you know, and mainly driven by, um, you know, revenue expectations on the basis of, um, you know, agricultural commodity prices. And this, so we're dealing at a, you know, at a microeconomic level, we're dealing with a situation where a farmer can get, that's my latest number, four to 5,000 US dollars gross margin, you know, profit, net profit, um, from a rubber plantation in Southeast Asia compared to an agroforestry system, you know. I mean, uh, if you go to feed your family, if I, if I would have, have to feed my family on, that, on the basis of that hectare, you know, I'd, I'd need to have a lot of convincing and a lot of support to not go there. Um, I'm not saying we, we, you know, this is the only way, but I think we need to have you, you guys doing your science and deliver us the data and the arguments so that at least we can show what, what the value is of these other services and how we can then also just cost other products and services the right way, you know, because I do think they, they, they do come at a <coughs> tremendous cost to society. Um, but but we've all been living on you know on those on those distorting subsidies um, that made sugar very sh cheap for us that made meat cheap for us and they they affected our diets you know so we need to think about that as well what do we eat and how do we eat um, yeah I, I, I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Anna. Sonia, did you have a comment? Please. Uh, well, I'd, I'd just like to bring us back to real landscapes and real places as a way of addressing several of the points that have been raised. I'm really strongly with Henry here. I, th I think that, uh, for example, as scientists, Michael, we're, we're often asked by organizations such as the World Bank, you know, what's the big winner idea that can be implemented everywhere in the world? It, it doesn't actually work like that. That real progress and real investment is, in terms of landscapes, going to be about real places that are fa facing multiple problems and have multiple groups of people with a stake in that which then draws me into um, thinking about what are some of the investment models that are emerging. Let's think about opportunity here. Investment models that are emerging to actually deal with the kinds of risks around landscapes better. And, and what I'm seeing all over the place that I'm finding really encouraging are these very strong partnership models. So for example, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil now is um, experimenting in Sabah in Malaysia with a jurisdictional um, approach to certification so that you have multiple suppliers working together in the area so you can actually deal with some of the landscape level biodiversity, water management and so on issues rather than, th and that allows smallholders to have some kind of 
a greater access and, and sharing of the risk associated. Similarly, um, I was in a conversation yesterday being told about the, the, the surge in blended finance models. So, for example, in, in resolving dairy issues in Kenya, bringing together finance from, from the off-taker to support progress by the smallholders and public money also going into that to achieve this mix of a more efficient s supply chain with, for example, um, greenhouse gas mitigation benefits. There are a lot more of those, but they happen with real places and real value chains. It's not like, let's do brilliant dairy everywhere. Um, uh, and uh, finally, there are a lot of opportunities with, with business at the global scale. So um, World Business Council and Sustainable Development is, is doing this. It's having new landscape initiatives, trying to bring different companies together around shared landscape level problems. We've also just come out of a World Economic Forum meeting where they're talking about doing the um, a, a hundred sustainable landscapes initiative of um, showcasing a hundred examples around the world of this kind of concerted shared partnership effort around investment. So just, just want to talk here and end up my, my spiel with the opportunity as opposed to just the problems and the challenges. Thanks. Great, thank you. Nazir, did you have any yes. comments? Uh, thank short. you. About the investment and financing, I think uh, there are a lot of thoughts out there to combine public financing, to combine commercial financing, and also impact financing, <laughs> and also partly grants uh, for uh, developing countries. Uh, more and more donors uh, talking to us for some Indonesia that please use our grants as part of the financing scheme, of course, with no interest, with actually even if there is no return at all, fine, it's, it becomes like a guarantee of certain percentage of loss of the, of the investment. So uh, I think this is uh, go beyond, uh, I mean, we're not talking about what specific finance is only commercial, it's only, I think we have to go beyond that now. The, the investors are fine to have uh, different financing come together and also with the public financing which is very low interest rate as well as the, the grant, thank you. Nazir, thank you very much. We do have one hanging question, uh, an important one about pollinators and uh, so I will ask Debbie to take care of that. Yeah, thanks. That's a great, uh, great question. I'm glad you brought it up. Like, why is Nature Conservancy working with corn growers anyway? I mean, we're interested in, in preserving natural ecosystems. But one reason we are is that soil and investing in soil health and soil productivity, including carbon sequestration, is one of the key entry points we see for conserving nature also by halting the the spread of agricultural production into our natural areas. So that's, uh, that's one of the major global challenges that the whole world is facing. How do we actually halt the spread of tilled agriculture into natural areas, which is what the pollinators are depending on? And we think one of the important entry points is soil health and improving productivity of our systems. Thank you, Debbie. And before we go to thanks, as we promised, we, we, we have $50 million set up for each of you to invest. And the room is wired with um, a new technology that as soon as you raise your hand, uh, international wire transfer goes right into the, the panelists' uh, bank accounts, exactly, yes. Of course, they're institutional bank accounts. Um, so I will ask uh, first for a raise of hands, where would you, or who would invest in peatlands and wetlands? I've got one. Three, four, okay, so we've got about four, okay, about 200 million going in there. It's not bad, okay. Um, for soil organic carbon. Okay, I'm gonna say about 15 or 16. Excellent, thank you very much. Trees on farms, agroforestry. Okay, one, two, three, two. Yeah, trees. Great. And uh, grasslands and livestock. <laughs> okay, uh, that's good. Yes, you invest in yourself. <laughs> Great. And oh yeah, okay. And a diversified portfolio across all of them. Ah, oh, there we go. That's the easy one. Okay. <laughs> the soft question. Okay. Very good. Okay, I'd like you to please join me in thanking all the speakers and the panelists, the dragons. Thank you very much. Very stimulating session, and I hope you have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you all. Thanks. <laughs>